Thank you very much, Chiara, for a kind introduction, and especially thank you, and I thank the Chamber um, of Commerce of Florence, through you and the President, uh, for having kindly um, asked me to take part in the organization of the event, and it has been a tremendous uh, experience, and I also thank my colleagues at the Permanent Court uh, of Arbitration. Uh, much has already been said in substance about what I'm going to say, which is rendering my task a lot easier. Um, it is true, unfortunately, that over the last few years, international disputes over cultural property have not subsided. Rather, they may be potentially on the increase, and the unfortunate increase in armed conflict, which has already been mentioned, um, particularly focusing in areas which are rich of cultural heritage, provide fertile ground for plunder and pillaging. Later, in peacetime, this may prove instrumental to the arising of international disputes of the kind we are going to discuss today. Increased disputes in the field may also be taken, though, as an indicator of successful criminal investigations, thus leading to new discoveries of artworks stolen in the past and illegally exported. Such discoveries are often the outcome of enhanced international cooperation between domestic investigation agencies, and we'll hear about it shortly after the break. My task this morning is to, to give a broad brush introduction, and to that end, my remarks are organized in five parts. First, I will briefly illustrate the generally recognized means of dispute settlement under international law, and possibly working on the domestic level. Secondly, I will touch upon the issue of the scope of the subject matter, which has already been raised earlier this morning. Thirdly, I will refer to the highly diversified legal frameworks which provide the grounds upon which any given cultural property dispute may be addressed. Fourthly, I will consider potential combinations of disputing parties. Uh, as we already have heard, there are quite a varied um, possible geometrical combinations, most if not all of them falling within the competence of the activities of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, as we have heard earlier. I will conclude by tentatively pulling the strings of these points, uh, sketching the bare skeleton of the dynamics in question, but the idea, I understand, is that the following sessions will add flesh to the bones. First of all, let me start from the basics, and it is useful to regard uh, international law proper in its interstate context. There, the Charter of the United Nations come to, to, to rescue Article 33 of the United Nations Charter refers to the following means of dispute settlement. Negotiation first, inquiry, now often called fact-finding, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, and judicial settlement. Obviously, those are means envisaged for interstate dispute settlement, but much the same mechanisms operate in domestic jurisdictions with regard to disputes between private actors of different nationalities inter se and between them and states or states' entities. This point anticipates the twofold character of the disputes that we are addressing today international ones proper in interstate terms and also the so-called transnational disputes. A significant number of the kind of disputes under consideration occur between source states and foreign museums. We have heard it repeatedly earlier. But also between states, foreign museums, or individual collectors, or auction houses, between private parties, disputes are normally between the original owners and museums, or again, auction houses. As we shall see, you only seldom have fully-fledged interstate disputes over cultural property of heritage, but you already heard about some. You already heard also that negotiation appears to be the principal non-adjudicative means of dispute settlement, but not just in interstate disputes through diplomacy. As domestic attorneys know full well, domestic and transnational disputes are prevailingly settled out of court. 
Also, it is to be noted that negotiation is overarching with respect to the other non-adjudicative means of dispute resolution, and it bears noting that all third-party non-adjudicative mechanisms, good offices, inquiry, mediation, and conciliation, are geared towards facilitation of a negotiated settlement of the dispute. And sometimes the same can be said of adjudication, when litigation is used as a power tool. Indeed, negotiations frequently run parallel to court action, which may exert pressure for the settled closure of the case. Good offices represent the lightest involvement of a third party with a view to facilitating negotiations, and it is confined simply to promoting communication between the disputing parties. In complex and highly technical disputes, such as those that we can be confronted today, inquiry or fact-finding by an expert third party may clarify the objective terms of the dispute, thus facilitating its settlement, including by negotiation. Mediation goes a step forward. Mediators present each party's proposal to the other one, emphasizing actual or potential common ground, if any, between the two differing parties, and these may cajole the parties towards agreement. Conciliation is a process that, process that encompasses elements of fact-finding, mediation, and possibly the submission to the parties of an independently crafted formula for the settlement. Such an end product of the conciliatory process may be hortatory or binding according to the terms of the parties' agreement to submit the dispute to conciliation. No third party non-adjudicative means may be triggered without the consent of the parties. Obviously, none of each of the non-adjudicative means of dispute settlement operate in a compart sealed compartment separation from the others. And we will see it more and more during the discussion that will be carried out today. Now, for purposes of our discussion, special mention should be made of the UNESCO Intergovernmental Committee for Promoting the Return of Cultural Property to its countries of origin or its restitution in case of illicit appropriation. For short, the acronym is ICPRCP. It was set up in 1978 and was vested primarily with mediation functions. For good or bad, it is to be recalled its purely intergovernmental nature. It is composed of 22 UNESCO member states who are elected for a term of four years. Its intergovernmental nature may be taken into account for its advantages in some disputes or disadvantages in others. Um, that is why mention should also be made of a non-governmental, wouldn't say institution, but body which is the International Council for Museums, which was established in 1946 with its seat in Paris, which works often hand in hand with the ICPRC, and also partners with Interpol, with WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, and the World Customs Organization. As for conciliation, Mrs. Evgenia Goryacheva has already indicated uh, the potentials, the administration capacity, and also the optional conciliation rules uh, based of the PCA, based primarily on ancestral conciliation rules, and the PCA can administer conciliation when proceeding purely under ancestral conciliation rules. As for adjudication, as already alluded, interstate litigation under public international law um, is uh, seldom experienced. A couple of cases will be, uh, will be referred to. One has already been referred to by Evgenia this morning. 
uh, it is important, particularly for uh, domestic attorneys, that adjudication in international law is does not know the concept of compulsory jurisdiction. So if you are advising a government, you want to be sure that the subject matter of a cultural property dispute falls within the scope of some kind of uh, treaty uh, uh, which receives the consent of both parties to submit the dispute before a judicial institution, the International Court of Justice. Now, the International Court of Justice, under its statute, affords another uh, means for the parties to express consent to jurisdiction, um, which is of a unilateral nature, but it works by way of reciprocity. And you want to be sure that the expression of consent, unilateral declaration of acceptance of the jurisdiction, other expressly, which would be quite unlikely, uh, reference to cultural property or cultural heritage disputes, or through its language, you may assess that cultural heritage or property disputes are not excluded. As for arbitration, again, reference should be made to the 2012 PCA revised arbitration rules, which are particularly handy. And uh, in the interest of time, I may just refer you to the PCA website, including providing model arbitration clauses that may be usefully adopted in international drafting international contracts, interstate treaties, or other mixed arrangements. And the same applies to the potentials of assistance of the PCA with regard to inquiry or finding mediation conciliation, as already alluded. Now, since dispute settlement is not only a matter for considerations of procedural law, I will make few considerations on the scope of the subject matter of international disputes related to cultural property. And the issue has already been raised earlier this morning about the difficulty of delineating a generally agreeable, uniform definition of the concept of cultural property in terms, in legal terms. And the point we already heard is not relevant only for ownership purposes, but also for cultural object circulation related disputes, particularly under the European Union legislation. We heard earlier this morning that national heritage legislations at the domestic level employ a fair variety of definitions which reflect, to some extent, different ideological approaches. We have heard also about the limitations on the topic uh, that we find within the European Union legislation, particularly regulation on export of cultural goods, which confirms the competence of member states of the European Union to designate a higher or lower number of goods as cultural. So a fair degree of national independence on the topic, which may clash practice of one state uh, with that of another, uh, which is also a potential cause for disputes. But there, European Union law will apply. And we know that the European Union judicial institutions are particularly jealous of applying European Union legislation. Now, international treaties also lack a perfectly uniform definition, but there I tend to be more optimistic because we public international lawyer, because that is my main background, tend to be flexible and optimistic. And there I seem to find ground for interpretation of international differentiated treaties on the topic under the interpretative principle of harmonization according to the terminology and the concept well illustrated by the United Nations International Law Commission in a famous report of 2006 on fragmentation of uh, international law. And let me quote, it is a generally accepted principle that when several norms bear on a single issue, they should, to the extent possible, be interpreted so as to give rise to a single set of compatible obligations, unquote. Leaving aside the initial instruments of the laws of warfare, 
when it comes to looking at the scope of a definition of cultural property or heritage, uh, we regard uh, amongst the laws of warfare as its matrix. The 1954 Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict, which was adopted under the UNESCO Aegis. It comprises immovable as well as movable property of great importance to the cultural heritage of every people, a very general expression. It provides also an exhaustive list of encompassing collections of artifacts, manuscripts, books, and archives, religious and secular monuments, archaeological sites, groups of buildings. Further to that definition comes the 1970 UNESCO Convention on the means of promoting and preventing the illicit import, export, and transfer of ownership of cultural property. It refers to property which on religious or secular grounds is specifically designated by each state as being of importance for archaeological, prehistorical, historical, literature, art, or science purposes. It provides a list of categories, and therefore, for an artifact to qualify as cultural property, the convention also requires it to be, it to be designated designated as such by the state authorities. Now, the big question is what happens when there is no such designation that covers a disputed artifact or cultural good. Uh, and there comes the 1995, for that purpose, 1995 UNIDRA Convention on Stolen or Illegally Exported Cultural Objects. This 1995 convention was actually promoted by UNESCO, even though it was adopted within the framework of the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law. And there we see that the requirement of governmental designation does not appear. Thus, a cultural property dispute at the domestic law level which falls within the scope of application of the UNIDRA Convention, um, defines such disputes as those bearing on return, restitution, or repatriation of stolen or illegally exported artifact, loan and deposit, acquisition, intellectual property, insurance of artworks, digitalization, donation, droit de suite, misappropriation of traditional cultural expressions, a very, very wide um, definition which is subject for interpretation by the competent judicial authorities or arbitrators. In some while on the definition of cultural property based on the various international and comparative legal parameters, an appreciable degree of uncertainty remains. It is arguable that by and large, with a pinch of optimism, there are sufficient elements that may be inferred from such parameters that allow a degree of jurisprudential convergence. Again, based on consideration that dispute settlement is also about substantive law around which a dispute has arisen, I will now address briefly the complex and diversified legal framework within which any given dispute is placed. And in the interest of time, I will deal with this point together with that concerning the variable combinations of disputing parties. Now, when the disputing parties are two states, generally though, not exclusively, the dispute is governed, as we saw, by public international law proper, that is, international treaties and customs. Disputes between authorities of one state and the private party, such as a museum, an auction house, or a collector, may well be governed by the civil or criminal law of one or more states. That does not exclude the actual or potential international interstate relevance of that dispute. And we're going to see in the end a couple of cases in which this double-layered uh, dynamics has presented itself. Most states are parties to a significant number of treaties that bear directly on the exercise of their domestic jurisdiction through negative or positive 
due diligence obligations relevant to cultural property, or simply to the treatment of foreign nationals. And we have to think of a foreign national who is a collector, who is the purchaser of uh, a cultural good which has been illicitly exported or importedly imported, depends on where you look at it from. That is to say that domestic, a domestic law dispute involving a foreign individual or a company or even a foreign state directly or through a state instrumentality may also amount to or become an interstate dispute. One such example is provided by a dispute between Liechtenstein and Germany, which landed before the International Court of Justice in 2001. There, Liechtenstein acted in diplomatic protection on behalf of a national whose cultural property had been confiscated during the Second World War in Czechoslovakia. Liechtenstein referred the case before the International Court of Justice precisely after resort to the German domestic courts by the individual who suffered the confiscation had proved to no avail. On the other hand, in transnational domestic judicial or commercial arbitration context between private parties of different nationalities, individuals or companies, private or state-owned companies, the dispute would be decided on the basis of the national applicable law including the national law bearing on rules on conflict of laws. So you may resort to a judge in state X, and the judge in state X may apply the law of state Y according to its domestic rules on conflict of laws. But there again, public international rules of which the forum state recipient may apply. This would depend on the number of and the quality of treaties, the kind of treaties that state is a party to. A distinction has been voiced uh, all along since early this morning uh, about situation, dispute, disputed uh, cases arising in time of peacetime whose origin dates back to a conflict, an armed conflict or colonization. It is a general principle that you apply the legal framework existing at the time when the disputed facts arose. That is why, even in time of peace, you want to look at the laws of warfare framework. International humanitarian law and international criminal law apply according to which destruction or plundering of cultural property are recognized as war crimes or even crimes against humanity. But such crimes involve the international criminal responsibility of the individuals involved, which fall outside the scope of today's discussion. However, the same criminal conduct may engage the international responsibility of a state that international destroys or intentionally fails to take appropriate measures to prohibit, prevent, and punish any international intentional destruction or subtraction of cultural heritage of great importance for humanity. While a large part of cultural property disputes are addressed in peacetime, we see that they originate from conflict. One is thus to recall again the just mentioned Hague Convention 1954 and its two protocols 1954 and 99, which were ratified by a significant number of states. The normative core of such conventional instruments consists of prevention, registration, other due diligence and compensation obligations for the state's parties. Therefore, the violation by state party of such obligations could give rise to a dispute between a state and another state party, or even between a state and a national or company of a state party to the convention or the relevant protocol having a different nationality, before the domestic courts of other states, which would apply domestic legislation incorporating the international convention in question. The same obviously applies 
to the 1995 UNIDRA Convention in a context which falls outside the laws of warfare. Chiara, how much longer do I have? Five minutes, so in interest of time, I will skip a number of passages and uh, go directly to an attempt to pull the strings of what ha we have heard before me and by me so far. And I will do so without trying to impinge upon the following discussions, which basically draw from the points that I have raised and will go much deeper into them. But let me draw some general indications. There is clearly, by definition, a public interest concern in everything we have been discussing, in every such dispute, whether it is between states or between private uh, parties. And it is rather curious that despite that, uh, we have very little record of interstate disputes, as much as it is in the realm of possibilities I have underlined a number of times. And that is because the prevailing public interest concern usually lies in the source state, and we've heard it from um, Francesco Rutelli a while ago. The source state it is the usually claiming state claiming restitution in the state where the disputed object is located, the opposing party, the possessor is usually private party, be it a collector, an auction house, or a museum. When there is a governmental interest in the continued possession of the disputed object in a state other than the source state, negotiation, diplomacy, we heard, is the preferred means of dispute settlement. If I may add a case that, reference to a case that has been made before by Francesco Rutelli, uh, being in Italy, let me recall the three treaty instruments of 1954, 97, and 2004 between Italy and Ethiopia, which led to the restitution in 2008. At the expenses of Italy, including restoration costs of the obelisk of Axum taken to Italy from Ethiopia in 1937, which confirms the um, indication singled out, fleshed out by Evgenia Goryacheva earlier this morning that most cultural property disputes do not, in peacetime, do not only arise out of circumstances under uh, conflict, armed conflict, situations of war, but colonial times. And there again we see that the majority of these disputes are being settled through diplomacy. And one of the indications that will emerge from the practice is that as much as this is a general indication, you want to apply your skills, your knowledge, your sensibility, very much applying them on a case-by-case -case specific approach, and we'll see how the same conduct may lead to different reactions when dealing with different nationalities, and I will get to that in a minute. But before I do that, let me go to the interstate uh, issue. We have already seen Germany, Liechtenstein, well, Liechtenstein, Germany before the ICJ, but the first and classical um, interstate this case, very well known amongst international lawyers, is the case between Cambodia and Thailand, which went before was decided by the International Court of Justice in 1962 and again in 2013 when Cambodia asked for an interpretation of the 1962 judgment. Why is it that we have this case uh, against a, a very poor record of interstate disputes? Well, there the cultural property element was subservient to an issue of the determination of the territorial sovereignty. Was the cultural property or heritage, the temple of prayer, where under 
Cambodian or Thai sovereignty. It depended on, depended on the, the limitation of terrestrial limitation, the boundary delimitations between Thailand and Cambodia. And it was only after the assessment was made, which is a purely typical interstate kind of judicial assessment that is to be made, very difficult to come to a negotiated settlement about boundaries, that the cultural heritage of the temple was attributed to Cambodia and therefore uh, Thailand had to engage in restitution uh, not just of the territory but of the artifacts that have been removed from the temple and heard by um, Thailand. Um, mention has been already made of the dispute between Eritrea and Ethiopia and that was a package deal which brought the case to interstate arbitration administered by, um, by, uh, by the PCN and Evgenia Goryacheva said all about it, and I will not repeat it. Um, now, negotiation, I said, none of the non-adjudicative means of dispute settlement operates in a, a sealed compartment separately from all the others. Now, let me make reference to one case between Peru and Yale University. There was a, 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 a cultural object that had been found in the, at the beginning of the last century by uh, a Yale scholar, an archeologist, I think it was 1910, Machu Picchu, was removed from Machu Picchu, taken to Yale University, restored, tremendous conservation, and, uh, and then the issue arose that uh, Peru wanted the, the object back. And um, negotiations, um, all of a sudden, 2007, Peru was unhappy about the way negotiations were going and filed the case before the United States courts. Um, a U.S. senator got into the picture, repeatedly made contact with the Peruvian president, Alan Garcia, and other government officials, went back to Yale, um, and finally, in 2010, the lawsuit was dropped. And the parties found an agreement. This case is particularly relevant under two uh, counts. Procedural wise, procedure wise, and substance wise. Now, um, let's look at the two agreements. I mean, the first one between the Peruvian government and Yale University required outright return from the university to Peruvian government by the end of 2012. The second agreement identified the Peruvian university in Cusco as the actual recipient of the disputed objects, and established partnership between the Cusco University and Yale. And next to that partnership, um, they provided for shared stewardship of the collection, joint organization of exhibitions in different parts of the world, collaboration on academic research. And there we see, in terms of substance, a point which was raised by uh, the mayor this morning and also by Francesco Rutelli. This tremendous tension between a nationalistic, ownership-based and possession-based approach on the one hand and the international circulation, fruition, enjoyment at the international level of cultural heritage. This kind of quid pro quo agreement resulting from painstaking negotiations seem to do the trick. I give you the good back, but we'll handle it together in cooperation for purposes of international fruition and enjoyment. Um, from uh, the procedural standpoint, um, what was the role of this US uh, senator? Was it mediation? From the standpoint of the University of Yale, maybe that was a, a mediator and he probably acted as a mediator, but from the Peru standpoint, he was representative of, uh, of the US government. And in fact, Alan Garcia made contact several times with President Obama. 
Now, this kind of governmental uh, diplomacy, which may be particularly fruitful in cases such as this one, may backfire in others. In a case mentioned by Francesco Rutelli a while ago, involving uh, the issue of uh, 52 disputed objects with the Getty Museum, at some point, the then ambassador in Rome, Ronald Spogli, tried, tried to make a démarche with a view to mediation, and that gesture was not absolutely taken by the way uh, President Alain Gassi in Peru took the, the senator's initiative at the time. So you want to take different stands to similar circumstances according to different national sensibilities on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, let me finally refer to not just bilateral negotiations, but the joint role of mediation by third parties properly considered at the multilateral level. ICPRC from UNESCO and ICOM. And we have success stories in disputes between Turkey and Germany and between uh, uh, Switzerland and Tanzania, which were brokered by, jointly by UNESCO, ICPRC and ICOM, which finished the job started. Uh, with UNESCO. Let me conclude. In some cultural property disputes tend to involve a wide range of claimants, both states and non-states actors. Such disputes may revolve around claims of title of ownership, restitution, repatriation, recognition of an historic or an historical injustice, or circulation of cultural goods. Such claims may happen to be invoked in combination. Restitution claims can arise when the disputed objects have been traded in peacetime, that is exported in breach of national laws through theft, illicit excavation, unlawful retention of lawfully excavated sites, removed during wartime, occupation or colonization. The former sources of the applicable law may change according to different international or transnational contexts, but their substantive principles tend to be converging. That is a sign of optimism, or maybe this is wishful thinking, but we are th I think we are there to work towards convergence, even where there is no uniformity. This, this degree of uncertainty, uncertainty, maybe um, I speak in these terms because I'm more of a, an arbitrator than a legislator, but that degree of uncertainty uh, with due respect for the na uh, rationale of the applicable rules, may be beneficial insofar as it may prompt a flexible application of such regulatory frameworks on a case-by-case -case basis. And on this note of optimism, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>